It's Wednesday, April 10th, 2013, and this is the Energy Education Podcast. I'm Kevin Hurley. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission evaluates the risks and benefits of a nuclear power plant based on a complex set of formulas, calculations, and computer codes called SAMA. In this week's show, we'll take a closer look at how these SAMA codes work. In particular, we'll discuss how the formulas themselves are not the problem, but rather what's wrong with the numbers being fed into the formula. Even the perfect formula can't yield perfect results without good input data. Joining us today are Arnie and Maggie Gunderson. Arnie and Maggie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having us. So I want to start out today's show talking about a recent New York Times article and several articles that have been quoting former NRC chairman Gregory Yazko extensively. Yazko is saying now that old nuclear power plants, that some old nuclear power plants should be shut down. Can you give us the details? The NRC had a a, a chairman, Gregory Yazko, until the summer of last year. And the industry wanted unanimous votes from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And he was always a dissenting vote on many significant issues. So instead of being able to tell the world the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was unanimous in their approval of nuclear issues, there was essentially a four to one vote almost all the time on critical safety things. Pressure was placed on him through Congress and he was forced to leave. Well, just last week, he was quoted as saying several things. First, that these old nuclear plants should not run beyond 40 years. Now, a deal is a deal. And he said, we had a 40-year license. We should not extend their licenses. And that, of course, upset the nuclear industry. And they went after him, uh, especially in the uh, New York Times story. The other thing Chairman Yasko talked about was the fact that the, the safety analyses for these plants don't take into account land contamination and massive social disruptions that were caused after Fukushima Daiichi. And that's not factored into anybody's cost-benefit analysis on whether or not nuclear plants should go forward. So he was very blunt that uh, the cost-benefit analysis is flawed and that old plants should be retired and not have their licenses extended. So, Arnie, how do these cost-benefit analyses work? Well, the industry term for them is SAMA, S-A-M-A, and it stands for Severe Accident Mitigation Analysis. And they have costs that they attribute to radiation releases. And when they do one of these SAMA analyses, they assume very little radiation is released. They don't assume a Fukushima-level release that requires evacuating the state of Connecticut, essentially. So when you do a SAMA analysis, if you don't release much radiation, there's no cost to society. So when they do the weighing the benefits of nuclear power against the costs, they understate the costs so that it always tips the scale in favor of continuing the operation of these nuclear plants. And in that rebuttal that the pro-nuclear New York Times and Matt Wald have given to former Chairman Yasko's statement is that uh, is from Nuclear Energy Institute, which is the chief lobbyist for the industry. So, you know, of course, the industry is going to say, oh, it's terrible. Everything's accurate. They said they've had this special task force and it's evidenced by a multitude of safety and performance indicators, and that's still the case today, and that's definitely not the case today. I mean, we can see that in many nuclear plants in the U.S. and throughout the world. So when they are calculating what the cost of a radiological release would be or some type of accident, what factors do they look at? What the nuclear industry has developed is a, is a computer code that calculates how much radiation is released and where it is released to. But then, you know, let's take the West Coast, for example, the, the San Onofre nuclear plant. The San Clemente community is, is nearby, and there's 
couple couple tens of thousands of people in that town. Now, out at 50 miles is Los Angeles, and there's 8 million people out that far. But let's just look close in. If the San Onofre plant were to have an accident, the radiation contamination in San Clemente would be huge. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't assume that houses will lose their property value. You know, there's tens of billions of dollars in property losses if there were to be an accident at San Onofre that isn't factored into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's SAMA analysis. So does the SAMA analysis take into account the cost of a human life? Well, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's cost of a human life are about half to one-third of what other regulators uh, use for the cost of a human life. You know, EPA and, and other agencies say a human life is worth two to three times more than the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does. So whenever they do these analyses and they show that you know, statistically one or two people might die from the, the radiation, they value a l- human life at about t- around two to three million dollars, where EPA is over five. So when you do that, the, the net effect is you never have to make a modification because the cost of the modification isn't justified by saving human lives in the NRC's model. So this is just another number that they feed into their computer code that makes the uh, end result say, wow, this is worth it. That's right. You know, when you take into account the fact that we're also subsidizing the insurance, you know, the nuclear plants don't, don't have to pay for their liability insurance. It's all done under this thing called Price-Anderson. So, you know, citizens have to pay in the event of a nuclear accident. It'll raise our taxes. Whereas, you know, if if you're an oil company or whatever, you've got insurance that pays for the cost of an accident. The nuclear industry is unique in that the regulator, the NRC, in conjunction with the people it's supposed to be regulating, the utilities, deliberately and knowingly downplay the risks. And at the same time, they lobby Congress extensively to have citizens pay for their insurance policy. So they get it both ways. They claim there's no risk instead of trying to insure these plants themselves. We're on the hook if there's an accident. So you've said many times that the secret is in the assumptions. And, you know, that was in technical discussion. But again, you know, this seems to be sort of the same vibe. Garbage in, garbage out. If you put bad numbers in, you're going to come to a bad result or a bad conclusion. Same thing? Definitely. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing, Kevin. The industry and the national labs work together to crank out these elaborate computer codes. And the computer codes do exactly what they're programmed to do. So if you put in a high cost, you'll show a a liability. And the input data into these computer codes always puts in low costs so that the nuclear industry can continue to perpetuate the myth that these things are clean, safe, and reliable. This sounds like me doing a monthly budget. I set up the Excel spreadsheet, get everything working and calculating, and then I put in imaginary numbers to just pretend. (laughs) It's similar to that. Mary Mary, uh, Lampert with Pilgrim Watch has launched an ongoing case with the against the NRC showing that the SAMDA analysis and the SAMA analysis are f- entirely flawed and that the code is entirely wrong and yet the NRC continues to look the other way and support the industry lobbyists. So what now is former Chairman Gregory Yasko saying about the SAMA analysis? You know, he's not saying anything that he didn't say when he was chairman. I was at the RIC Regulatory Information Conference last year, which was one year after Fukushima Daiichi accident. And you'll recall, because you shot the video of him presenting to the nuclear industry, that there is a severe problem with the SAMA analysis. And the audience just sat there and snickered. I I was appalled that there was no respect for the chairman's uh, position, that we need to realize that a nuclear accident is going to disrupt lives and it's going to disrupt communities. None of that is factored into the SAMA, and Chairman Yasko didn't have to retire before he said that. 
The industry ignored him when he was chairman, and now they're trying to bury him after he's a, a, a former chairman. That's pretty true, Kevin, in that any commissioners, there's only two commissioners prior to Chairman Yasko who have not gone back into the industry to be rehired at exorbitant rates and work for the industry. So it's a vicious circle of they come from the industry or they're appointed and they, they have some kind of huge donation, like one chairman that we knew had donated many millions to a, an election campaign, and they get these appointments, and then they go out and they get hired by utilities and energy companies. And Peter Bradford, Victor Galinsky, those are the only two commissioners previously who did not do this, and, and, and Yasko has not gone to work for the industry either, you know, so these are truth sayers. I hope Yasko has a plan B because his if, if plan A was to get rehired by the nuclear industry, he just he just destroyed plan A. That's for sure. And no one would know better than you, right? That's right. My experiences uh, would parallel his in that regard. So now we've talked a lot about the sort of I'll say cherry pick numbers or the. Uh, bad numbers that get fed into a formula like this. But on the other end of that formula is what's really coming out. Arnie, can you talk a little bit about the comparison between what the SAMA analysis believes might pop out on the other end versus what's really happening? And perhaps Japan is a good place to start. Well, if we look at what happened after Fukushima Daiichi, you know, we have contamination 200 miles away Let's look at Tokyo. You know, when I was in Tokyo, I took five samples, and those five samples would qualify as nuclear waste here in the United States and would have to be shipped to Texas for long-term storage. Well, the, the SAMA analysis doesn't assume that any contamination gets out beyond essentially a mile or two. So what Daiichi told us is that we have societal risks out to several hundred miles, and we have massive contamination out to 50 to 100 miles. Well, the SAMA doesn't include decontamination. It assumes that the soil uh, remains in place. There's no uh, power washing of homes. There's no decontamination of farms. There's no decontamination of vacant lots. None of that is in the SAMA analysis, in close let alone out at uh, 100 miles or more. So the net effect here is that what Daiichi should have taught us is that if you have a nuclear accident, society is going to be severely disrupted, not just within five miles of these nuclear plants, but out to a couple hundred miles. And the cost to displace people and essentially ruin their lives is not factored into the SAMA analysis. And I think that's what Chairman Yasko said when he was a chairman, when we recorded him at the Regulatory Information Conference. And that's what he's saying now. He hasn't changed his tune one bit. The industry just doesn't want to face the fact that a nuclear accident can disrupt lives. Because right now their formula is telling them that it's all worth it. The secrets and the assumptions, Kevin. I would think we must have known that more could be affected than, you know, the most immediate area around the nuclear plant. Why wasn't the SAMA analysis updated following any historical nuclear events? Well, the party line on Three Mile Island is that nobody was killed and the containment withstood the accident. You know, the, the uh, Three Mile Island presentation that's on our website that I made back in Harrisburg four years ago clearly shows that the, the containment did crack in the hydrogen explosion at Three Mile Island, and that enormous amounts of radiation were released. The, but the industry didn't want to admit that, and it managed to avoid it. And, of course, Chernobyl was communists running that plant. And, you know, if, if capitalists ran it, it would be run better. So the, the net effect is that the industry just ignored Three Mile Island and ignored Chernobyl, uh, and continued to move forward. And, and now we've got, you know, Daiichi, which is run by capitalists and is a modern reactor, and the containment did blow up, and yet we're still not facing the reality here in the United States that the cost of an accident are l a lot more severe than what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is willing to admit in their SAMA analysis. Final question for both you and Maggie. If we were to put 
accurate, well-represented numbers into the input of this computer code, this formula, the SAMA analysis. How do you think that would change the way nuclear power is done today? I think it would dramatically change it. I think especially all of these aging nukes like the Mark 1 BWRs that, that have such huge risk associated with their spent fuel pools and the amount of radiation they would release. I think that economically they'd all have to be shut down immediately. Arnie? You know, I'm, I made this argument to the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards for the, um, the new plant at Vogel. And I went into their, it's called the SAMDA analysis because it's in the, the design phase. I made the argument that you're assuming the containment doesn't leak. And the NRC said to the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards that, yes, that's right, containments do not leak. Well, we just blew three of them up at, at Fukushima Daiichi. And yet the NRC has not gone back in to reevaluate that assumption. The net effect would be that these plants would not get relicensed and the new ones would not get built if we properly included these costs in the cost benefit analysis for nuclear. So it just wouldn't be worth it. It would clearly show that the, the risks outweigh the benefits. And that's not what the nuclear regulator nor the nuclear industry wants the public to hear. Arnie, Maggie, thanks so much. Thank you for having us, Kevin. Well, that about does it for this week's edition of the Energy Education Podcast. As a reminder, you can view the video referenced in this podcast with former NRC Chairman Gregory Yazko by clicking the link next to the show. You can also join us back here next week and every week for more on what's happening in the world of nuclear news and more nuclear technical discussion. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For Fairwinds Energy Education, I'm Kevin Hurley. Thanks for listening.